under 16 team. He didn't win a game, but he had nine out of the 11 played in the Premier League. I know in the modern generation, people expect to have things straight away. I suppose the most important thing, what you said, was it took me 20 years. But what it wasn't, you know, it's not like I'm an overnight success. And I remember he took a free kick, pretty central with his left foot, bent it in the top corner. It was a foul over on our left wing. And he came over and I said to him, now Mason, this is a right footer, I think, from here. And he just looked at me and then just bent it in the top corner with his right foot. And thank you. After doing my research, I was um, very happy to find out that um, you're a Hackney man yourself, like myself as well, um, yeah, which, was, yeah. which was interesting to find out. Um, so I definitely want to touch a little bit about that um, working in Hackney because it's a, it's a special place for me um, and, and, you know, I'm sure it is for you as well. Absolutely. Yeah. No, yeah. I enjoyed working there. Um, 20 years of my life. Uh, in Hackney, so went in there. I'm, I'm not that old, so, but I am quite old. But <laughs> when it went in there, they're young. So um, yeah, I, I was uh, went in as the assistant youth worker at the Crown Manor Club, okay. which is in Hoxton. Um, still there to this day, and I'm still a trustee in a different building because they they sold the original premises by the Regents mm -hmm. Canal. It's a big high rise block, but they've got the, the bottom section of it. So um, yeah, if I look back at all my kind of work, I suppose those 20 years in some ways were the best years um, and I still feel proudest and most satisfied by the work that we did um, mm -hmm. and not just me there were some remarkable people that were there and are still there um, and if you look around the game um, you'll find people that went to the Crown of Manor Club so people like Michael Donaldson and Mehmet Ali who are both yeah. at Reading who um came through a programme that we run at Crown of Manor, a football programme, um, Jason Mason. And then and then people like Matthew Joseph that um, went to the Centre of Excellence um, at Lily Shaw and was at Arsenal and, and Leighton Orient and Cambridge. Um, and when he was at Leighton Orient playing still, he came and got involved doing the coaching because I knew both his brothers. He'd been around the place and it was nice to get back to him. A guy called Lee Smelt, who's goalkeeper at mm -hmm. Arsenal and Charlton. You know, I, I met him on my B licence and said, look, you know, he was he played, you know, however many hundreds of games, was at Nottingham Forest for a time, but had retired and was a policeman. And, I, you know, got him back into into coaching because he was a really mm. good goalkeeper coach. And he just went on from strength to strength. But, yeah, now it, 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 there was some remarkable, I mean, it's tough, don't get me wrong. And, you know, I'm not sure I could do it now, but um, the things we achieved there in all sports, not just football. Yeah. You know, where I was watching something, somebody sent me some stuff today around um, the kind of uh, retired boxers association that's um, been done. It, is, it came from kind of Hackney Museum mm. um, and it was looking back at some of the retired boxers and there was a boxer called Ian Napper, well, it's still boxing, mm. I think, but, you know, and, and he was talking about his time and, you know, he was a crown and man, a boy. And I remember, you know, seeing him kind of grow up and mature into a, you know, a really good boxer and, and we had lots of things. So it was a remarkable place for a little club in the East End of London um, where we did, you know, some fantastic things. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of that and I'm still proud to be involved with the club. I miss my my cold feet on Market <laughs> Road because it used to be the coldest place in the world. Yeah, it definitely was. Why was um, it so cold? Like, I don't understand. Why I was it know. super cold down there? I think I think it was just because it was wet, the floor, and then you just stood yeah. in it for ages. But my feet always used to be really cold. And I, and I don't remember, you know, and I played and coached in the Hackney and Leighton mm -hmm. League and Premier League on Hackney Marshes and, you know, around there. And that was always, you know, for anybody, it's really hard. And I took a team from Loughborough down to play on the Marshes against mm -hmm. London, uh, University of East London because most of the guys at Loughborough are quite privileged. Yeah. Um, and I wanted them to take them somewhere, you know, one that, a little bit which was close to my heart. And although it's changed, it's not quite the same mm -hmm. as it used to be. You know, I think it is just a, an unbelievable place in terms of football heritage to go and, and see and be a part of it. So, you know, at the time when you were trying to get yourself showered and you had to walk across, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. one building to another and, yeah. and it was freezing and it was, then you're queuing up for your, your bit of food afterwards yeah. with somebody that had been kicking the life out of you beforehand. And, you know, but just seeing that, you know, just remarkable number of pitches and mm -hmm. trying to find pitch 360 on the, the <laughs> south marsh and then yeah. getting there somebody's on it and then you have to go yeah. back and then you had your nets to put up mm -hmm. 
you know, I just, all of those experiences, I think, are, are fantastic. And so we try to recreate it a little bit by taking a group down there. And they were surprised, you know, even mm-hmm. they were like, this is unbelievable. But yeah, not, not quite the same as it used to be on a Sunday morning. No, not yeah. at all. Not at all. I remember um, the other day I was driving down there with my wife and um, we haven't been past there for the past, what, five years? And I was yeah. saying to her, the grass is immaculate compared to what it was when I used to play on it. So, yeah, it's just completely changed. And when hearing, you know, the likes of Crown and Mariner, like you just mentioned, I used to play against them on Market Road. I used to play for Finsbury Park. Um, so it was like, you know, every Wednesdays or Tuesdays or Thursday matches, it was just... I used to look forward to those more than than actually academy games because it was just fun to play with like your mates and things like that. So nice, it's it's yeah. brilliant to to hear those stories from from you as well. Um, and there were some really good. Play- I mean, you know, when you look back, uh, you know, this was probably before academies really started. Yeah, the quality of play was um, there were some really really good players. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and you know, we used to go in things like the London Cup and things like that. Yeah. And you know, we we had a really good we had really good teams. And uh, we had a bit of a link with a team that used to be called Arvinsdale, which you yeah. know, had all the top players and they played for us as well. And, it, you know, a guy called Frank Schillingford, who's still there, ran, ran the thing. And you know, we'd get to the semi final and get beat, you know, and you're thinking, well, how do we get, you know, and, and there were some, you know, we had players, I don't know, like Melvin Cableton, Marvin Cableton, Andre de Leon, Rachel Willock, Chris Bart Williams. Mm-hmm. You know, we had these players that were like, um, you know, just fantastic players. We couldn't even get to the final. Yeah. Um, and a few years later, once the academy started, I remember putting teams in, and you kind of play th- two rounds, and you're in the final. You know, and you're thinking, well, that never would have happened. And I know it's yeah. a bit throw some tinted glasses, but yeah, you know, the quality of players that used to play up at Market Road and on the marshes or Vicky Park or you know wherever was just was fantastic. No, for sure. And, and yeah, it's definitely changed now. The pitches there as well. When I used to play, it was the, the Sandy Astro. Now it's got the 4G. Um, brilliant pitches at the moment. So, yeah, no, I definitely still, the use. I, I still got the stars down my legs. You definitely know. You'll feel, you'll feel it once you get the yeah. shower, for sure. But um, we don't, well, ladies and gentlemen, we've done something different here. Um, usually I'll do my introduction, but um, once I found that, that Richard was a was a hackney and is a man himself we had to dive into that which we'll, i'm sure we'll touch a little bit more about that but um if you didn't know um right now i'm joined by one of the pillars of um, football in, in in uk london um has worked with spurs qpr england uh, now director of football at loughborough university um without further ado richard allen thank you for coming on the, on the podcast really appreciate it no thank you for inviting me it's a, it's a pleasure nice to be here Brilliant, brilliant. Um, before we move on to the nitty gritty stuff of your career and things like that, um, football at the moment, weird place. What's your take on the elite game? Do you feel like you know the elite game is kind of disconnected from the fans? What's what's your overview um, opinion on on what's happening at the moment? Yeah, we can't think we're at this kind of tipping point, aren't we? Because you know, I guess those of us who have been around a long time can remember when. The Premier League pulled away and, and, you know, people had their concerns and then mm-hmm. suddenly this kind of wonderful product came along, you know, and, and the Premier League, I think it has become the, the best league in the world, which then means you get the best players, the best entertainment. Um, that obviously then attracts different types of owners who think, wow, I can make some money. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't really understand, you know, how football is in this country, the pyramid system and the way that money should flow down and, you know, they don't get the fact that teams get relegated and one year you're going to get this amount and next yeah. year you might not. You might be in the in the, in the championship. They just don't get it. Um, and, and I think you get to a point where obviously the owners then feel that they need to, to change it because they want to maximise their profits. Um, but I think, I think well, across Europe, but certainly in this country, they underestimated how people would feel about that. And, and it was nice to see that, you know, suddenly people are up in arms and, and people mm-hmm. have to take notice. Um, I, I guess for the world supporter, if you're a Tottenham supporter living in Shanghai or or somewhere else in the world, they might want us to just watch Tottenham playing against Barcelona and Real yeah. Madrid and PSG and then Man United. And they don't probably understand the fact that we've got this rich heritage of, of clubs that play and, the, and the, the fact that, you know, I'm a Nottingham Forest supporter, you yeah. know, and Nottingham Forest have struggled for years and, and 
But I remember when they won the European Cup and, and won the league and were regulars at Wembley, had the best players and did all the great things. And, you know, that, you know, that needs to be able to happen again. And people need to have their moments, Leicester or, you know, whoever it might mm-hmm. be. Um, so I think, I think there are a number of things that, you know, that are troublesome at the moment. That is obviously one of them. I think, you know, we need to get a grip of technology. Uh, yeah. You can't get rid of technology. You can't disinvent things. But I was speaking to a, a guy that I know who's an ex-Premier League referee, and he, he's very good friends with Dickie Bird, the, the cricket umpire. And we're talking about how maybe cricket umpires, he never used to make many, he didn't make mistakes. Very mm-hmm. rarely would he make a mistake if you looked at all his decisions. But in some ways, the officials get a little bit lazy and their eye actually actually gets worse because they don't need to be so accurate because they can just say, oh, if I don't get it right, I can just go and yeah. check and get somebody else to look at it. So actually now they're, they're kind of coming off it a little bit. Plus it also brings into sharp focus that the rules aren't particularly clear. And mm-hmm. maybe the people that are there looking at the games don't really understand the rules or don't mm-hmm. kind of get it. Um, and I'm not saying it's easy. It must be really tough. And I, I like, I'm sure everybody's trying to referee a game. Yeah. And and it's and it's not easy, you know, and you're getting shouted at even from <laughs> like a training game, you're thinking, yeah. oh, I didn't see it, I just didn't yeah. see what happened there. And you're yeah. trying to guess a little bit. And so I think all those things just make it, you know, it's, it takes away the entertainment. Mm-hmm. And, and although you want to see the game, you know, technically really good and you want to see flair and you want to see those things. I, I hate to say it, but I want to see tough tackles and I want to yeah. see confrontation and I want to see the whole, I want to see the whole gambit, you know, mm-hmm. of what it is. And again, it's it's dangerous when you're getting a bit older to think back to what it used to be like. Yeah. And if you look back, some of it was pretty terrible, but there were some really, really good teams that mm-hmm. you know I can remember. And you know, it pains me to say, but Arsenal were were pretty yeah. good at one point yeah. and working for Tottenham and all those things was a little bit difficult to say. And Man United, you know, Mm -hmm. and you knew that if you were going to go up against them and technically try to outdo them, they could beat you. Yeah. If you want to go and have a fight, they'll they'll fight and they'll Mm -hmm. beat you. You know, Mm -hmm. there was just, they could could then cope with playing Barcelona in the Champions League, then playing at Stoke, then playing at, you know, Man City, then playing some, they just, they just were able to do all of those things. I think sometimes, whether it's rule changes or just the way the game becomes a bit sanitised, I don't know. For me, I find that a little bit disconcerting. I suppose. Yeah. Do you, do you feel because you said a lot of things there, which are it can it resonates to to what I believe as well. Um, do you feel you've seen you've watched a lot of matches throughout your time, and do you feel football uh, kind of resonates how life is at the moment, where you're saying you know things like tackling, you know, there's not much of that that's happening at the moment, whereas um, back in the days our parents would just let us go and play on the streets. Now it's completely changed. You wouldn't want your kids to be out in the streets as such a, after a certain time. Do you feel yeah. football kind of resembles how life is at the moment? Yeah, listen, life has changed. I mean, it always will change. And, and maybe we do become a little bit more sanitised in everything that we, mm. we do. You know, the way that, as you say, just being allowed out and get back into your tea yeah. time, you know, and roaming around and doing stuff. And yeah, that, that you, you can't... So you can't, you don't, you don't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe because you do feel it's unsafe or be, become more protective. And I go that, I guess that then brings into the focus about resilience. You know, one mm-hmm. of the things that concerns me is how do you build in resilience to people yeah. if they're not able to fail because mm-hmm. we don't allow them to fail because we say, don't go and do that because you might not get through and you might get rejected. And so therefore mm-hmm. don't try it. Or I, I was, you know, when I went to school, um, not many people got lots of O levels. Not many people, my day GCSEs. Not many people yeah. got A levels. You got A levels, you're like, mate, you're you're in that top. genius, yeah, yeah. And and not many people went to university. Mm-hmm. Now, everybody seems to get GCSEs. Everybody seems to get A levels. Everybody seems to go to university. Mm-hmm. And when you know during this pandemic, when people were saying, you know, I, I, I don't know what my grades are. Everybody's expecting A stars. I'm thinking, I mean, everybody gets an A star. You know, how, how <laughs> yeah. do we? How do we? And when they weren't, I can understand why they're finding it really difficult to cope with the mm-hmm. uncertainty and all these things. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, it's easy and people work hard and maybe more time and efforts put into education. But I just wonder how you you, you make people more resilient by, yeah. especially when you're younger, in a controlled way. I'm not just saying being thrown to the, you know, sw- learn to swim by being thrown into the swimming pool, yeah. obviously not, you know, but there, there has to be a, 
you know, a little bit of risk sometimes. And we are so risk averse, you know, in everything that we do. So, yeah, I think I think you're right. And the world is a different place and, and it's mm. really difficult to then change change back to how it was. And I'm not saying that that was a, a glory time because there was obviously lots of things going. Yeah. We just have to look at the kind of, you know, the historical sexual abuse cases that have mm. come out and the reports, you know, that wasn't that great, you know, yeah. And, yeah. and you do need to make sure that young people are safe, clearly. Mm. No, I definitely agree with you. And, and and speaking about playing, you know, playing in the streets and things like that, we definitely seen there's there's a lot more players that have come out and they're very creative. But do you feel like the element of street football has kind of died down a little bit where, you know, we had the players of Joel Cole who would come out, um, who was very, very technically gifted. Um, obviously the likes of Rio Ferdinand, John Terry that have come from that sort of background as well. Um, do you feel that that sort of football's kind of gone out the window a little bit compared to the likes of Holland where you know they embrace that culture a little bit more and France etc I think we've gone through that a little bit uh, and I think we hopefully have come out the other side because mm-hmm. now you look at some of the young players like the Phil Foden yep, as well, yep. you know who's just you know absolutely fantastic and we seem to be producing a lot more technically gifted flair type players mm-hmm. Jude Bellingham who's out in, Jod- uh, in Germany with Jaden Sancho and yep. all those people you know, and I was lucky to work with some of those for England, and they they are absolutely fantastic. Um, but I think we did go through a stage of becoming too regimented, mm. uh, and you know, I, I, there was a little bit of me at the beginning of when E Triple P was introduced and all those things. I think it has had a positive effect. I'm I'm not keen on having. I think when somebody once described it as like IKEA flat pack <laughs> football clubs, yeah. where you go it and it's this is what you have to build because I think everybody, mm-hmm. I think every club needs to be subtly different because yeah. it's you know they're all different. Um, and I think there was a point in time where maybe that creativity was coached out of players, mm-hmm. um, and they went from what they were doing at the weekends to going into an academy where suddenly this is how we're going to play and this is what you're going to do. Yeah, don't do all that nonsense. Just yeah. keep it nice and simple and pass it. I, I, I'd like to think that we've gone full circle and now you're seeing better coaches mm-hmm. in better environments where actually they figured out to be a top player in the modern game, you need to have that. And certainly when I went into Tottenham, you know, we, we had a kind of a fundamental change about how we wanted to do things, yeah. um, which people laughed at, you know, there were other clubs that thought it was mad and we didn't have anything to back it up. Um, turned 15 years later, we got lots to back it up because yeah. suddenly they're starting to produce those types of players. So, you know, thinking about how we dominate 1v1, um, taking players on in the, in the foundation phase rather than passing it. Of course, starting to recognise where you're 2v1 and it might be a better option. Mm-hmm. But whereas, you know, lots of clubs would be saying, pass it, pass it, pass it, and try to replicate what the first team was doing. We were saying, no, don't pass it. Take them on, take them on. Mm-hmm. We wanted messy games that didn't look like a first team game. Yeah. It did look like a game that was in the in the, in the playground. And that's mm-hmm. my, my old boss used to stand there and say, oh, I don't like this. It, it, you know, it, it's just too neat and tidy. We've got to mess it up a bit. It's got mm-hmm. to be scruffier, just so that players. Now, it wasn't very pleasing to the eye. We used to lose a lot. Parents sort of thought, "Oh, my, you know, my son's not getting the ball enough because everybody's being too selfish." Mm-hmm. But it did get them fundamentally understanding some of those basic kind of skills and techniques that were required. Then building the decision making. I'm not saying that you know passing is easy, but that's probably yeah. an easier thing to do than taking somebody on 1v1 every time. Um, mm-hmm. And of course, they don't talk defenders how to defend properly because you were trying to dominate 1v1 with or without the ball. So um, it just started to develop, I think, better players. And I think other clubs are doing the same thing because you know we've got to produce players in academies that are going to go into first teams in mm-hmm. the Premier League. That's teams that are full of international players from this country or you know more from abroad who are all absolutely world-class. Mm-hmm. No, for sure. And... and... Speaking about the messy element, obviously, as a coach as well, sometimes you're quite cautious, you know, from from the people that's looking from the outside in, that it looks well presented. And once it looks messy, some people question it. Um, Parents will ask questions and, you know, it becomes it becomes a whole conversation. Um, And also staff, you know, being a being a director of football or director of an academy. How do you get staff on board with that sort of mentality, that mindset um, where, you know, it might be unconventional. It might be something new that they've never seen before. How, how, what's the challenges with that? I, I think there are massive challenges. I, I was very lucky when we went into Tottenham. Uh, John McDermott was the academy manager. Mm-hmm. I think I was his first appointment. Um, we then had Chris Ramsey joined us. Yep. Um, 
but Alex Inglethorpe, you had a number of other people joined uh, and somebody like Chris Ramsey, you know, it, it's, it's what he believes in as mm -hmm. is John and other people. So you suddenly start getting a group of people that you believe in it. You then add more people that believe in it. There, there were some that really struggled and some changed, you know, mm -hmm. and, and kind of saw the light or decided that they thought this was a good idea and, and you try to persuade and there were others that said, it's not for me. I don't believe in this. And, that, and mm -hmm. that's fine because there's more than one way to play football. We're not saying the way that we had was the, the only way. So there was a turnover of, of staff. And I remember at the beginning where you'd have a coach and you'd be saying, right, we're going to play 4-3-3. Three, three. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, 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 absolutely all over that. And this is what we're going to do. You'd literally turn your back and it's 4-4-2 four, four, and they were going long. And you'd, and you'd go, whoa, whoa, what happened there? No, 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 yeah. I'm not. I'm, I'm still... So, you know, that was difficult and you and you, you know you have to be able to persuade people and mm -hmm. chivvy them along and try to educate and explain what you're doing over time it becomes easier because suddenly it's starting to work mm -hmm. you know we were doing skills and stuff with our uh, you know with our younger players which are under 16 17s couldn't do and we try to get it into 17 18 year olds mm -hmm. we were getting into our pre-academy so by nine they were they were technically more able than some of the the some of the older boys, players yeah yeah and then you kind of just build that in and i remember then going to queen's park rangers and trying to do the same thing and people saying oh you're just trying to create a re recreate a tottenham mm -hmm. and we said well no it's something i believe in so it'd be worse if i came here and said oh we're not going to do that anymore yeah. well, what kind of person would i be if i mm -hmm. didn't actually i spent all this time doing that and and saying it was a good thing clearly i'm going to come here because i believe i believe in it and the results prove somewhere... it as well though richard like you yeah, said the course. results prove it yeah and but at the beginning, you don't have so many of those players that you mm -hmm. can point to and say, so we used to have a, you know, we had a, a, a principle of sometimes, you know, um, recruiting players to play down age groups because yeah. we, you know, we thought that was the right thing to do. And then suddenly you have uh, a Ryan Mason or a Tom Carroll that come mm -hmm. through that have, you know, consistently played down, down, age, down age groups. We've rescued from being released because they were deemed as being too small. Mm -hmm. Um and at the beginning, you kind of say, well, this is what we think. And then suddenly when they're playing in the first team and they're, or they're getting transferred somewhere else and they're playing, you can say to a young player, look, this is what we're doing. This is your, this is your kind of plan. Mm -hmm. um, and parents, look, and this is what Tom Carroll did and, and he's doing okay now, yeah. so trust us. And you can build up that trust. When you don't have those people, it's hard to persuade because they'll say, oh, I don't know if that's going to work and maybe I'll go somewhere else. He's also trying to get over the fact that we were very much about developing individual players, yep. not teams. So we didn't have that kind of ethos. Not saying that we didn't want teams to win and, and players to win, because you need that winning mentality. But we that wasn't the main priority, because we realised actually you're not going to get the whole of the under nines through into the whole of the first team yep. at Tottenham. Yeah, you probably get one. So therefore, you're trying to develop them individually, and then you hope that it's not just one. Then you've got two or three go off and play somewhere else, and mm -hmm. yeah, everything goes from there. So I think um, parents found that quite difficult because they came from their child playing a winning team at, say, seven or eight or mm -hmm. nine or ten. They're the best players and the best teams winning all the games. And then we were putting them in a team where we lost most weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember if you speak to Chris Ramsey, he had an under-16s team, didn't win a game. But he had nine out of the 11 played in the Premier League. So mm -hmm. you're saying, well, what, what's, was it that important that we lost those games if we were doing the right things and developing the players and then the players go on and, and, you know, get careers in the game. That's, that's far more important than the under 16s beating Queens Park Rangers on, yeah. a, on a, on a Saturday morning or what. Um, so going to QPR, I think it, yeah, it was, it was more difficult because at the beginning, you know, you're trying to persuade people as this is a good idea. There are less of you. It was only mm. me. Um, over time, you start bringing like-minded people in and start yeah. making those similar changes. Um, and I was there for two years. And then guess what? You know, Chris Ramsey came in after mm -hmm. me with Les and others. And Chris is more radical than I ever would be. And, and also <laughs> had, the, had the backup to be yeah. able to do it. You know, it's hard going into a club. You've got to look above you as well as what's below you. You need support from above. One thing I learned at Tottenham was having John McDermott as that buffer Mm -hmm. was fantastic because I now know the battles he would have had to have fought with people yeah. higher up the club, you know, keeping the manager at bay, keeping the owner at bay, you know, why are we losing? Why aren't we getting players through right now? Um, going to QPR, I didn't have that kind of cover. It was mm -hmm. me. Now I've got to try and do it. Um, and I'm not saying it's still easy. I think it was probably 
Chris going in there with Les Ferdinand, who he knew very well, yeah. and Les would give him that cover is probably quite helpful. But you know, they've gone from strength to strength mm-hmm. based on a similar sort of philosophy. Um, so yeah, it, it is it is difficult to to get people on board. It becomes easier if you've got a, and that's why you see I don't know Dutch coaches all over the world yeah. because they all just all Spanish coaches and all the big clubs all over the world because they'll say, well, hey, look, my, my our system works because mm-hmm. we've won all these things. And they'll say, oh, yeah, the Spanish way is the only way, yeah. or the Dutch way. And, uh, you know, we haven't had that success at international level. Mm-hmm. We can't really say, you know, English coaches in recent years have absolutely dominated world football. We haven't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, therefore, it's harder for people to follow our, our philosophy, I suppose, sometimes. Mm. No, but in terms of the work that you guys did is remarkable because th- we can talk about the list, you know, um, Harry Kane, obviously being top of that chart, um, Gareth yeah. Bell, Ryan Mason, Tom Carroll, um, Andros Townsend, Jonathan Obiko, who's played in the lower divisions. Like, you know, yeah. there's so many players that have come through that system with, you know, the way you guys kind of structured the academy. Um, so, you know, the, the proofs are put in. Um, and I was um, fortunate enough to to do a CPD with Chris Chris Ramsey um, at my time at Arsenal Community. He came in to do a CPD for us, and um, in in a way where it was the session was it wasn't structured, but there was so much learning outcomes out of it. At first, I think people were a little bit um, caught off guard, but by the end of it, they really enjoyed the session. Um, and and for me personally, I, I love sessions like that because it's not so rigid. It's not so regimented where, you know, you become a robot at the end of the day. It's not game realistic because in a game, you know, things are, you know, there's a lot that happens in a game. So, um, no, totally agree with what you said. And um, in terms of speaking about Ryan Mason, did you ever think um, in 2021, Ryan Mason will be first team manager at Tottenham? I can safely say I I didn't. (laughs) (laughs) I remember listening to him on Talk Sport Radio and he was trying to decide what he wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And I um, I remember bumping into him where he'd just gone into Tottenham coaching. Yeah. And um, uh, at Loughborough, we host uh, Derby under 23's PL2 games on our pitch, stadium pitch. Uh, and Derby were playing Tottenham. So it was nice to see him, you know. And even then, I think he was still just deciding what he really wanted to do. Um, and then got the opportunity over within the club. And yeah, I wish him all the best. It's, you know... A, Whatever happens, you know, whether he'll be there, obviously, at the beginning of next season is, is, is probably unlikely, knowing mm-hmm. Tottenham. Um, but to gain the experience he has, and, you know, it was a tough one last weekend, the cup final. Yeah. Um, you know, good to get a win this week. And and it's it's a highly pressured, pressurised job. And, you know, for somebody who, you know, has played the game, knows the game, mm-hmm. but has never coached at that level is, is, a, is a tough one. So... Um, yeah, no, great that he's given it a go, and uh, you know, I, I wish him all the all the best. But no, I wouldn't have seen it coming. Not 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 yet. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's incredible, incredible. But yeah, best of luck to Ryan Mason going forward. Um, I want to take it back a little bit, um, Richard, in terms of the, the your time working in Hackney. Um, like I said earlier on, I'm um someone that's worked and grew up in Hackney myself, um, and I understand the challenges that comes with working in in, in Hackney. Um, just want to speak about your experiences working in Hackney. What was that like? Um, any challenges that you met along the way? And also the connotations that, you know, some people see as a, a unsafe place. Like, what's your experience um, working in an environment like Hackney and Islington? I guess, you know, I went there when I was 19, 20, when I first started working. So my okay. first job, really. Uh, and you know, from somebody, I was born just outside London, but had lived in, in the West Country, moved up to Nottingham for a couple of years, came back in. It was a bit of a rude awakening, you know, to mm. come into the heart of London. And I think people, the way I dressed, the way I looked, the way I spoke, probably were thinking, what, what's going on? <laughs> um, uh, but I never, it's interesting. I, I probably go there now and feel less safe than I did when I, when I lived there. When I lived yeah. there, I lived above the club. I was there. I knew everybody, everybody mm-hmm. knew me. I was there for 20 years. So I, I could go pretty much anywhere and I'd know people and people mm-hmm. knew me because you know, people threw, grew up through the club. And, you know, so you felt kind of, well, you're young, so you always feel like indestructible, but yeah. I felt indestructible, felt safe. Um, and, I, and I'm still a trustee of the club. So I know the challenges are somewhat different now. So again, mm-hmm. it's easy looking back. 
um, you know, there, there wasn't the, the kind of whole gang thing going on. It, it seems it seems much harder to run the club now than it did then. The problems mm-hmm. that they face, but back then, yeah, you know, we had all those social problems that others did. We had, but fundamentally, the the kids who came to the club were fantastic. The club was great because it was run by some really good people. And even though, if you look at it, the club was I thought it was lovely, but it was you know dilapidated in some ways yeah. in terms of facility. It wasn't it wasn't brand spanking new then. It was it was old. It was having to put it back together all the time. And you know we used Shoreditch Park to go and train on, and yeah. we used to have to carry goals from Shoreditch Park down the road. All the traffic had to stop as we carried the big eleven side goals because you couldn't leave them there because they would get probably get broken or stolen. Um, but the, so you know in terms of facilities and the amount of people that were working there because most of them were volunteers. Um, but they make a place and they were mm-hmm. absolutely remarkable um, people like Alf Camp who unfortunately is no longer with us used to sit and take the subs used to run the athletics everybody knew Alf everybody mm-hmm. if you you speak to some old time football players um, that used to you know he's played the game at the highest level Johnny Pratt used to play at Spurs if you ask him why he could run through the mud at football games it was because he did cross country for Alf Camp you, mm-hmm. you ask him now to this day he'll go oh it's Alf mm-hmm. So you have people that committed their lives to these kids that were coming in. Um, and in modern times, people like Frank Schillingford that you might have come across. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a bit of a legend in, in, in that area. Uh, totally committed. We used to run projects and he'd always say, that kid, yeah, he's terrible. You've got to deal with him, Rich. You've got to get him out. Well, let's mm-hmm. kick him off. He can't play on the team anymore. And I'd call <laughs> him in. I'd give him yeah. it. And I'd write that. So you go... People like Mark Marshall, who still plays. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember, so, right, that's it. You're out. You're out. And then you come at oh, Rich, do you think we've gone a bit hard? Let's, oh, let's get him back in. <laughs> Thank you, just told me, didn't, oh, yeah. right, mate, come back in, we'll give you another chance. Yeah. Um, guy called Dave Tapping, um, mm. you know, a whole range of people that used to, or still work there, uh, Brenda and, and Pete, and, and all these guys and girls and women that were, were there, um, just, just had a, a real love for the club and a mm. desire to try and help. It was and it was interesting because it was founded by Winchester College. So a lot of public schools have these kind of missions within mm-hmm. kind of you know, um, difficult areas. And and the one thing they backed everything we tried to do. Where are some of the kids? I remember a boy coming in saying, oh, I've been to my careers teacher and he said, um, why don't you work at the leisure centre? You know, I'm not saying that's a bad thing to do, mm-hmm. you can work at the leisure centre. He said, But I said I want to be a lawyer. And they said, No, no, you, you know, come on be realistic Mm -hmm. you're not going to be a lawyer no i want to be a lawyer and when i told the story to the committee members again if he wants to be a lawyer let's help him be a lawyer you know if he wants to go to work in legislation that's fine but he doesn't Mm -hmm. and 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 we backed him and helped him and he became a lawyer you know and 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 so there were some really kind of driven kids some of them and i see again i see a lot of them now who had horrific you know kind of upbringing in terms Mm -hmm. of you know, difficulties at home and, and things happening and, and quite, you know, so horrendous things that went on in their lives outside. But a club was, it's kind of like it's safe space where they yep. could come. Mm-hmm. Highly committed. Um, if, you know, we could do anything and they'd always be up for it and you'd yep. take them everywhere and do anything. Uh, when we used to take football team down to Winchester, so we used to flood the place, take a coach load, three teams, for kids. And they didn't know I hit them. You know, I think mm-hmm. the police got called every time because they thought there was some strange things going yeah. on in the street yeah. to Winchester. Um, but yeah, what, were, were there, were, was it tough and difficult? Were there things happening? You know, high crime rates, you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, protection rackets. I remember a, a boxer, I won't say the name of an ex-professional boxer came in and said, you know, I've retired now. I've just come to collect my, I'm going, no, no, we're not. We're not yeah. doing that. We're, yeah. we're not giving you. Well, you, you. Oh, sorry, sorry. You know. Oh, yeah. Um, and it just had this kind of place. So the club had a place in in the community where, you know, it, even the dodgiest people in the world would come and they would box and they would play yeah. football and they would. But their behaviour and and the impact you could have on them by just showing them a different way and giving them different experiences and 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 investing in them and trusting them to, and mm-hmm. you know, again, I could go through a whole list of people that went through that kind of environment that have done really really well not just in sport but outside yeah. of sport you know um kojo a comedian who, yeah. who's like yeah. a top yeah. comedian he, he was part of the crown of Manor football academy yeah. you know you're thinking all right he didn't play football but he became one of the best comedians in mm-hmm. in, in the country yeah um, so it's just it, i think 
the stereotyping of people that come from those areas, and, it's, and it happened in football. You know, you'd always talk about, ah, oh, that that guy that comes from, you know, his son comes from that area. Mm-hmm. He's greedy. It's all about money. They've got nothing, so they want more money. They're pushing. Do you know what? The conversations I've had with most of those parents, that's far from it. They're not thinking about money whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, you just people just assume they're greedy and they've got nothing, so that's all it's about. And, and they're, that's that they're very moral, very kind of like, no, we're not, we're not doing that. Um, biggest problem I had was trying to get players to come out on a Sunday because they had to yeah. go to church. Mm-hmm. You know, those kind of struggles rather mm-hmm. than because they felt this was the proper thing or, you know, education being more important. Mm-hmm. So uh, the other thing I always found with with working at Hackney, I think it is a melting pot and you yeah. could always see how life ebbed and flow. So there was a block of flats just behind the club and just the people that lived there changed over time because obviously it was an initial destination for a lot of communities. So, you know, back in the day, it would have probably been being white working class, maybe mm-hmm. Jewish even, um, and then people move out and then it suddenly becomes... Uh, you know uh, caribbean backgrounds mm-hmm. and it would become african backgrounds and it was then it was eastern european backgrounds mm-hmm. and it was and you know and i also noticed that our boxing section if the economy was strong and everything was going well we didn't have as many boxes as soon as the economy dropped it was flooded with boxes who wanted mm-hmm. a box you know mm-hmm. and again all those kind of things happened in that area but i, I, I loved it and i loved the people there uh, and i think sometimes you say they, they, they got a bad reputation and yeah. i think that was you know un, unjust uh, but i do know that it is i think it's more difficult even though it's become more gentrified in lots of areas mm-hmm. the kind of whole gang culture thing has made it you know we didn't i, I didn't ever feel like i was going to get stabbed or shot you mm-hmm. know i'm not saying that didn't happen in the area i think the staff there feel more you know under pressure uh, and and you know more about security than mm-hmm. perhaps we did where you know, it was self-regulated and people just wouldn't dare coming down there and creating trouble because they were, the community were based there yeah. and the community wouldn't let them do it. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think it's that family culture that was that was embedded back in the days. I remember I was part of the Springfield Boys Club. I'd, I used to go there. Yeah. And that was, to me, that was like family. We'd go there, play pool, play table tennis. And it was, you know, we'd look up to the the... Um, the volunteers that were there you know um, and it was that family Steven culture that. Yeah, okay. there you go so yeah. you you would never feel like you have to um, step out of line because they they basically created so they created a safe space for us to, to come into and and you know express ourselves I think times have definitely changed like you said it's gentrified there's new people that's come into the area that don't really understand the area as such um, I remember you know going to football certain times and um cultured cultures outside the, you know outside of Hackney I, I, I was playing for Northampton and certain cultures would say to me you know my attitude was different to the rest of the boys where they felt like I had a chip on my shoulder or or you know I, I spoke in a certain way um, but for me it was just it was a thing where you know we had to fend for ourselves as well at certain times if if you couldn't do that people would walk all over you so it kind of yeah. reflected in, in certain attitudes it wasn't negative as, as such but you know certain cultures would, would take that the wrong way things like maybe turning up late to to training sessions you know I'd have to travel from Hackney all the way to Northampton on, on a Saturday um, it's not easy my mum and my dad are working you know yeah. it's you know trying to make ends meet so it's things like that that people um, sometimes misinterpret about the area. Um, like you said, it's, it's, there's a lot of gems that come out of the area, um, but it's about, you know, fine tuning and understanding these people. And I think that's the trouble with certain areas like Hackney where, you know, cultures or certain cultures don't really understand the people in it. Um, not as much as yourself as someone that's worked there. Well, that was one of the biggest challenges. So going, one of the reasons I got employed at Tottenham was because, they were very conscious that they weren't recruiting from inside the North Circular. Um, mm-hmm. You know, all the players from Harringay were going into Arsenal. Um, Hackney players were going there. Everybody was yeah. going to Arsenal. Arsenal and Chelsea were kind of then anything over, it would go to West Ham, Charlton. Mm-hmm. Well, and we were getting the ones after that. So there was nothing going on. And clearly, my experience, I've been doing other things as well. And I got my A license and I've done some international stuff and I've worked the FA a bit. And, but Fundamentally, I knew London and I knew yeah. the players in London. Um, and, you know, consequently, my first bit was making sure we had the right scouts who could work in the right areas. And then suddenly we were getting lots and lots of players. Tottenham at that stage, you know, at Chigwell, 
were we were, we were called the four by four club because mm-hmm. everybody came in a four by four. You know, everybody was getting expenses as well. They all got sort of yeah. a bit of money to bring. And we said, no, we're not we're not doing that anymore. Um, and I, I say, and, and again, if you look at the, the players that have come through, not not all of our players that came through at Tottenham um, over the years were from from Hackney or Harrington. Yeah, you yeah. Know, it was a, an area around, but some came from Hartford, like. Um, oh, um, Oliver Skip, so he mm-hmm. comes from that way, and you've got some of them from St Albans. You've got some, but then you've got the Walthamstow ones, and yeah. you've got people like Jafat Tanganga from from mm-hmm. Hackney, and so we introduced these, we introduced new players, and the coaches did find it difficult at the beginning. That that story you said, you know, people would say to me, oh, they're not committed." You know, that player's not committed. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he, every day he's late, every training session he's late. You say, "Yeah, but he's come from Hackney. He's picked <laughs> up his sister, given her a tea, got on a bus, got on a train." And then if you knew the old training ground, it was a murderous walk to get from the tube yeah, station yeah. Luxford, all Lux, the way it down. Luxford, Luxford, yeah, Luxford Lane. Yeah, Luxford yeah, Lane. Yeah, Luxford yeah. Lane was horrific. And they're five minutes late. You know, you've got to give them credit. They've done mm. more than any of us have done today to get here. So you've got to look at commitment in a, in a different way. They're, they're well committed. Um, and you're right, the behaviour sometimes was d- different. I wouldn't say it was bad. It was just, you're right, a bit more streetwise, a bit more mm. challenging. Mm-hmm. they'd ask questions they weren't going to just roll over yeah. and that suddenly the coaches had to change and so again some of those coaches absolutely no problem at all and they embraced it some just just had to go you know mm. um and we changed it was i think john mcdermott i was listening to him last week and he was saying that when we first went in there was it was like a picture of the, the whole academy the whole of academy of, of tottenham was five black kids in the mm-hmm. in it when you think this is tottenham hotspur Mm-hmm. you know from london you know yeah. <laughs> in harringay mm-hmm. and and actually most of those players not all of them you know it was they lived in chigwell you know and it was the son of a, a doctor and a lawyer and and again nothing nothing wrong with that but we yep. certainly weren't weren't looking at these other areas where we knew that there would be talent but it was mm-hmm. a challenge to get people to change their mindset mm-hmm. and i think obviously that's changed now anyway going forward in 2021 that we're in now that's that's changed all the clubs you know are in uh, inner city London and they're all fighting for these players um, yep. every single day. But um, going forward, you know, Loughborough football, you know, th- another reason why I wanted to start this this podcast was to kind of show um, the use, um, you know, there's different directions that you can go towards. If you don't make it into the professional game, you can go into university and still be able to play football. Um, when I looked at the the programme of Loughborough and the football um I wish I was able to to join that when I was younger. Um, it, it's always, it, to me, it had that feel of like the American football um, in terms of scholarships and playing football and education, um, which that's I've never really heard of that before in, in the UK. Um, what what made you go into that sort of role, um, working within you know academy football and now working in um, university? Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I really good three years at the FA you know uh, I'm very proud to work for the national teams and Mm. you know my dream I can never you know you talk about Ryan Mason becoming manager at Spurs you know when I was a youth worker in Hackney I don't think anybody would have thought that I would have ended up as head of talent ID for the for the FA yeah you know working with with Gareth and all the coaches all the way below you know winning under 17s on the 20 world cup um you know doing uh, you know it's a dream come true for anybody I, I think after doing three years, I wanted to do something different. And although it's clearly not the same as working in Hackney, but it mm. is around developing young people, it is around education. It's 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 a more than just being in a professional football club. Yeah. Um, so it, it was a little bit about kind of going back in a funny kind of way. The, the only difference is that we don't have to train on Shoreditch Park and play yeah. and play the <laughs> because we have really good facilities. Yeah. But it's really funny actually because um, we played Russian and Diamonds under 21s with our development group mm. and a boy called Alex Mola scored and Alex is a Crown of Manor boy so I'm really okay. proud of it because one of my big things when I went to the university and, it, and it's one on the university's agenda as well as you know in terms of diversity and inclusion mm. how you know somewhere like Loughborough can make sure that that it is open to everybody um and clearly to get in there you've got to be pretty bright but i know mm-hmm. lots of bright kids from Hackney, and and, For sure. and, and uh, you know just because it says you've got to have two a's and a b that's that's doable is getting people to think that they actually can go to, to loughborough mm-hmm. and they will be accepted in there um and i think it's you know 
the, the university campus is getting more diverse. Our football teams are getting more diverse. And that's one of my things that I was really clear about that I wanted to change a little bit, that I just mm-hmm. didn't want it to be, you know, all white teams for privileged kids mm-hmm. from outside London or outside, you know, they're like leafy suburbs and nice private schools. Um, again, yeah, we, we've made some changes on, on that kind of front. But um, yeah, no, I, I think it's great. It, the the program is really good. It's really strong. You know, people who come there that want to, you know, who are strikers, are a mathematician, you know, they're not all doing sports related subjects. Mm-hmm. There's a whole variety of them. The facilities that we have are as good as most Cat 1 clubs. Um, you know, this pre-season we'll have Man City's under-23s coming in. Okay. We've got West Ham's 23s for pre-season. You know, last year we had Celtic, uh, Forest. Um, we've got some ridiculous games pre-season, first team games on our stadium pitch because it's, it, you know, it's so good. Mm-hmm. Um, and we keep on getting inundated because, you know, the facilities we have on and off the pitch are second to none. Um we're working really hard with the Premier League because, again, I think on their agenda, it's about um, transitioning out of football and giving mm-hmm. people opportunities and exit strategies. So they do um, residentials with us for under 16 players that have been released, thinking about what, what happens next. Mm-hmm. They also do like a, a pre, pre-season pre camp for those who are still looking who have been released from clubs after a scholarship or even after a pro contract to kind of prepare them for going out on trial. But the, mm-hmm. the, the messaging in the background is there's something else here for you. And we're starting to get more players that have been at that level who say, do you know what? Um, I want to do it slightly differently. Yeah. And there's no reason why I can't come into this program, still play at a, a good level, get looked after in terms of, you know, that wraparound support mm-hmm. and, you know, improve to a point where hopefully if they want to, they can go back into the game but if not, they come out with a fantastic degree. A Loughborough degree is very valuable mm-hmm. and it makes you very employable. And if you look around, you know, I talk about the Crown of Manor boys that I'm really proud of around the game. Goodness me, if you go to Loughborough yeah, and, and look at the, they're still players obviously playing, they're big boys go and play, but you've got people like Sam Arif, who's had a performance at Man City, you know, who I know for years, but I didn't, I hadn't really realised that he was a Loughborough mm-hmm. graduate. Um, Nathan Gardner is at Fulham. Dan Machichi, you know, from from Arsenal. Mm-hmm. Um, they're all Arsenal. Uh, they're all, sorry, they're all Loughborough um, graduates. Jack Robinson, who's the goalkeeper at Liverpool. So there's this kind of fraternity of, you know, alum of the university that are out there, most clubs, which, you know, rightly or wrongly perpetuates the whole thing. When you go to mm-hmm. Loughborough, I get a call from Nathan Gardner saying, have you got anybody, Rich, who can play at the right level and, you know, has got a lot for a degree and yeah, we'll, we'll have them in as an intern or we'll look at them to come in and, you know, as a member of staff. Um, so, you know, it gives a, a far more options and rather than thinking, well, I want to play, well, it'll give you mm-hmm. a dual career option. Yeah. You can still keep playing and you might end up playing in the national league. You might get promoted back in. Mm-hmm. Um, but if not, you, you become very employable and guess what? You could go and work at a Tottenham or a, an Arsenal yeah. or a Man United or a Man City and have a career in the game, even though it might not be, as you imagined it when you were a young player mm-hmm. growing up. But Kieran McKenna, you know, he sits on the bench yeah. at Man United. Mm-hmm. So I know Kieran because he was at Tottenham uh, as a player, retired early, um, went to Loughborough, part of the programme, comes back to Tottenham, um, and now is, you know, went to Man United and now the first team coach of Man United. So, you know, there's all these different kind of, it's a bit like football players, you know, it's yeah. not linear. You don't just come at the bottom and go to the top. You kind of come in, you go mm-hmm. out and come back in again. And life's a bit like that. You know, mm-hmm. one stops here for injury or you're not quite at the level, you get released. Well, there's other options. Come into our programme, for example, and then, you know, might go back into the game playing, but you might end up going back into the game doing something else. Incredible. Like I said, I wish that programme, well, it might have been back in the days, but I never heard about programmes like that, to be honest with you, when I was growing up. So anyone that's listening and feels like this, that might be an opportunity for you, definitely grab it because, yeah, like I said, I wish I had that opportunity. But speaking about yourself, Richard, like you said, you know, you've come from um, Crown of Manor, 20 years working in Hackney and is it, and how does someone find himself working with England with QPR with Tottenham what's the magic formula well I mean people often ask me that and and you know I know 
in the modern generation, people expect to have things straight away. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, I suppose the most important thing, what you said was it took me 20 years. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't, uh, you know, it's not like I'm an overnight success. Yeah. 20 years working in Hackney, um, you know, getting my coaching awards, working with players and working, listen, we had some really good players back mm -hmm. in the day, um, creating new programs. I, I, you know, I'd always had that inkling that I would, I would love to get into the game, but, you know, I put myself out there. I, I did lots of different things. I um, would go to watch the best coaches working. So I did my license with Dick Bate, who was mm -hmm. a legend in yeah. coaching. Um, but if I saw that Dick Bate was doing a coaching session somewhere, I'd, I'd get there. I'd get to Leeds. I'd jump in my car or I'd get on a train or something to get there. Um, I used to have a little... Um, I, I, out of the blue, somebody said, oh, England are looking for somebody to act as like a liaison person with a the Spanish national team for under 16s okay. or under 19s when they come over, do you fancy doing it? Cause nobody mm -hmm. really wants to do it. Cause it's a lot of running around and you know, it's not, they, they don't treat you particularly well. And, mm -hmm. and it's a bit, you know, oh and yeah, I, give me that. I love it. And for about th three or four years, I just did every team that came over. And I, to this day, I know all the Spanish people, I know the Portuguese people, and I, which helped me then when I went to Tottenham, mm -hmm. but I watched people like, um, there's a coach called Iñaki side who ended up as the Spanish national team coach, but again, a legend of Spanish football. And this was on the cusp of when Spain was starting to get back in. Mm -hmm. They hadn't, they were worse than us in terms of European and World Cups, but then they obviously went and got on with it. And I'd just come back in and copy their sessions. And I remember Michael Donaldson, when I was at Tottenham, said to me, because he was a coach uh, like part-time, mm -hmm. and they were doing some coaching CPD. And uh, he came over and said, Rich, Rich, we were doing that 10 years ago. I don't know. <laughs> And I'm saying, no, no, I, I just copied it from yeah. the Spanish. You know, I, I, I can't take credit for it. Yeah. I used to come back to replicate the session. And of course, then, you know, 10 years later, we're all doing it because mm -hmm. that's what, you know, it's the new thing. So I, I definitely put myself out there. I would do and take advantage of everything. Um, I'd never say no. I, I, one of the things I, you know, even though it caused me problems at home and, you know, <laughs> things I had, I'd say, yeah. I'd say yes to everything. Do you want to do this? Yes, I do it. Can you do this? We used to take kids up from Crown and Manor to do the A-license assessments mm. at Bisham Abbey or Lillyshaw. I thought it was a good experience for the boys, but you're kind of, you're putting yourself out there the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, I can even remember almost, I shouldn't say this really, John McDermott, if he ever hears this, I remember hearing that John McDermott was going to Tottenham and I heard that he was going to a game. At, um, I, think, I think Tottenham were playing in the FA Youth Cup against Ipswich. Um, I went. To, I made sure I was at the game because I knew him because he'd done some stuff for Crown and Manor when mm -hmm. we introduced the football academy, and I'd and I'd done a few other little bits and pieces with him. I didn't know him well, but I managed to park in the same car park he parked in. Wow! And I bumped into him as he got out of his car, and I walked from the car park to the stadium and just chatted. Didn't say I knew anything about mm -hmm. it. He didn't say anything mm -hmm. about it. And you know, a month later, he gives me a call. Says, you know, you know, we had to chat. Mm -hmm. I, I thought I was a coach. I wanted to be a coach. I wanted yeah. to be a coach at Tottenham. And he was saying, can I have a chat with you about not coaching? It's about being head of recruitment. I was thinking, well, yeah. He said, because you know, you know, you know London. Da, da, da. And, and that's how I got in the door, really. So I manipulated it a little bit. Incredible. But, you know, I think it is about, you know, d doing whatever you can, really, to create the relationships, um, do the networking, mm -hmm. anything you can. Because... I think when people, when I was first employed at Tottenham, there were a lot of those old school people who said, yeah. what are they doing? Who's Richard Allen? He's a youth. You know, they have, maybe heard about me a little bit, but they didn't mm -hmm. know who I was. And I didn't fit how they would have perceived a head of recruitment at Tottenham Hotspur would have looked like. I didn't look like any of the ones that they had mm -hmm. before. Um, so I was definitely a left field, uh, you know, kind of appointment. And then you just got to be, be as good as you can be. And, you know, I'm very proud of the you know as you mentioned and I'm, I'm very cautious to say oh I signed this player and I signed that player mm -hmm. and they signed when I was there so my you know the things I put in place kind of worked and but you know the work that Chris Ramsey and John yep. McDermott and Dadley Allen and Tim Sherwood and you know all those people Les Ferdinand did with those players is, is, is ridiculous um, but you know we did we did really very well and right. you know i we had a sporting director called Damien Camoli came in. I got on really well with Damien. I, I was able to work with him. That put me into situations where I was working with Daniel Levy because we were talking about bringing players in. Mm -hmm. And even though we got players wrong, you know, 
and we and they didn't quite work out we spent some money we got some players really really right and they come through and you then build up a bit of a reputation you know so I think when I was at Tottenham suddenly I get a phone call saying you know we're looking to change things at QPR are you interested mm-hmm. um we'd just been through an EPPP audit the first one at Tottenham and done really well um went into Tottenham that didn't even have a training ground and it was a, a bit of a mess and it was like you know come now kind of work your magic yeah and and you know, luckily we had some really, again, some really good people there. I brought in a guy called Alex Carroll that is still there as the academy manager mm-hmm. at yeah. Tottenham, who came in as my ops guy. Um, you know, loads of people. Paul Hall, who's still there with the 23s, who's fantastic. And Paul Furlon. Um, you know, there's so many people. Glenn Hodges was there when I was there. A guy called Nick Dawes was my head of coaching. And suddenly we, we kind of changed things. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been doing stuff for the FA. Um, and... Again, you know, the, the, the FA job came up and I thought, well, I can't not not try and do this. And you build up your reputation and you're, you, you're decent at what you do and you work hard. And I think, um, you know, I think you have to have in, integrity as well as being knowledgeable and good at your job. And I think mm-hmm. then I hopefully people will recognise that and you get those opportunities. Incredible. Well, you heard it there, people, hard work, dedication and... Make sure you turn up to car parks where people are at uh-huh. as well. <laughs> That's no. it. You've got to have your network of intelligence and contacts to make sure you're the right place at the right time. Nice. But do you know what it is, Richard? I think, I think, I don't know, speaking about the new generation, I can't see them doing things like that. Like you said, I think we're living in a, in a place where things, people want things instantly. You know, we can order food and it comes in the next 20 minutes. We can order clothes and it comes next day delivery. We're upset if it doesn't come next day delivery. Do you know what I mean? So I think things like that, what you just explained, I find it hard to believe that, you know, people would do that these days. I'm not too sure. What do you reckon? I think it is hard. And I try, I do stuff at university and we talk about, you know, networking and mm. contacts. We about, I did something the other day with somebody about using LinkedIn, you know, all yeah. these kind of things and building up. Because people kind of, I have this perception that I know everybody, and I don't. Mm-hmm. I don't know everybody in football. I know a lot of people because mm-hmm. I've worked in it for a long time, and I'm, I've been very lucky. But the perception is, you know, everybody. How do you do that? Mm-hmm. I say, well, you know, I'm I'm 56 years old now, and I spent all my life gathering. You know, and if you're expecting to get this at 18. Mm-hmm. I didn't have all these contacts at 18 years old. Mm-hmm. I had no contacts at 18, and mm-hmm. my expectations weren't that I could sit at the top table. And, and again, one of the bits of advice, and, it, and it's not very, I don't know, uh, people don't see that in these days it should be so. But I remember, again, John McDermott saying, as a young you know, person working his first time around at the FA, he used to drive people around like Howard Wilkinson and all that, lot, and he'd put the cones out. And he said, I would never have got involved in the conversation. You know, if he's going to see Jimmy Armfield, I'll sit in the, com- I'll sit in the corner and I'll mm-hmm. listen. Mm-hmm. I'll listen to the conversation and I'll learn. I, 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 you've got to earn the right to contribute. Mm-hmm. And I don't think we have in, in, in modern society that that feeling. It's not the right thing. Oh, yeah, you should have the confidence to, to just pitch in and, and do stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think I say to some of my guys, you just got to sit back and listen. You're not, and it sounds harsh, but you're, you're not at the right age or experience. To, you've got to know when you can and can't con- contribute to a conversation. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you just got to keep your mouth shut and listen to what's going on and learn from that. Um, now listen, I, I also know other people. I don't know if you know a guy called Tundi Adashokan. So no. Tundi works at Arsenal. You know Tundi? No. So I've known Tundi all my life. He, I mean, all my working life. And Tundi's quite a character. He works at Arsenal still. Um, you know, and I know Tundi. Tundi will go, you know, if there's a back in the day when there was a table at the training ground which had Pat Rice and Arsene Wenger, mm-hmm. I wouldn't have gone and sat on the table. You know, he would go and sit and say, excuse me, guys, can I, can I sit here? <laughs> Hi, I'm Tundi. <laughs> and you know what? He, he, and he kind of, and he still is the same. If you, I yeah. spoke to him the other day. I was going to do him and he's, he hasn't changed. He's, he's, he's like that. He gets straight into there. Um, and, and, you know, I was at Tottenham. I'd sit and, you know, I, I wouldn't have a problem sitting with Damien Camoli or Daniel mm. Levy or Joe Jordan or Harry. Some of the other coaches were, were you know, wouldn't come and sit down. You know, they say, no, we can't, we can't do that. You know, that's not our, where we should be. And I'm not saying that's the right thing, but I just think, you know, it's a long way of answering your question. But I, I do think that, yeah, people do expect everything they expect mm. and our guys are the same i'm at loughborough i leave university i'll get a placement um i might even get an internship and I, that might turn into a job mm-hmm. and then i remember the qpr guy was there one of the one of the analysts when i've got a master's i should be in the when can i work with the first team you've been to scott here yeah 
you've got to serve your time. You've got mm -hmm. to work in the academy for a number of years, build up your knowledge and expertise to be trusted, and you might get a chance. Their expectation was, well, I've been here six months. When, when do I get to go with the first team? <laughs> you know what? It yeah. took me 20 years to get through the door in football. Mm -hmm. And and you're right. I don't think modern, you know, the modern young person necessarily has the patience. And that, you know, I'm not saying some don't. I know some who work really, really hard yeah. and are dedicated to what they do. And I think, guess what? Those people are probably the ones that are going to be successful. Mm -hmm. No, I definitely agree with you. Um, Richard, before we wrap things up, I want to do a quick fire round question with you. Okay, um, okay. First one, first question, best moment in football? Ooh, I'm not a QPR fan, okay, um, per se. I work there, but Bobby Zamora goal in the playoff final against Derby was one of the most... Um, I'm Forest supporter, same thing against okay. Derby. Actually, <laughs> that, that, that was remarkable. Or... Um, I, I remember um, watching Adele Tarab come on for okay. the game when he came on to play for Tottenham against West Ham, making his first team debut. And having signed or being involved in signing him, it was like, mm. going, he's coming, he's got, you know, I'm trying to ring people to say he's mm -hmm. coming on. So those kind of two moments. I, you asked for one, but there's two. No, amazing. I mean, and speaking of, of, of Adele Tarab, incredible talent, incredible talent. What what do you think it was? Why do you think he didn't take it to the highest level? I mean, you know, he's playing for Benfica at the moment, still at, at top of the game. But what was it that it didn't make him sustain that sort of level for years? It's hard, it's hard really, because uh, Adele, is, it was, yeah, you say he's a genius. And I was with him at Tottenham and then a little bit when he went to QPR mm. and, you know, he went out on land, uh, loan into Milan. And I remember coming back on a Sunday morning and saying to me, he was in the gym, which is unusual for Adele on a Sunday morning. But Rich, what are you doing at QPR? It's rubbish. We were the best club in the world. I was the best player in Milan. Mm. And I can't even get him to the bench at QPR. <laughs> well, at 18, I remember being at a game with him where he said it was a reserve game. I think it was Dartford uh, were opening their new ground. And he played. And he was unbelievable. Unplayer boy did ridiculous things. And he came off and he just had the ump. And he was swearing to me. I said, well, what's the matter? I should be in the first team. I am the best player in the world. Wow. Adele, you're not the best player in the world. And, and I thought he was like tongue in cheek. Mm -hmm. He was saying, I am the best player in the world. I said, but Messi is better than you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah. No, I am the best player in the world. So, the, I mean, it's good to have that kind of self-belief. But with Adele, he went from being the best player on the pitch and being loved to the worst person mm -hmm. on the pitch and his own teammates wanting to go and punch him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, inconsistency, probably a little bit of, you know, I am better than everybody else. And, and I think when it comes down to it, if you look technically absolutely fantastic you know mm -hmm. i think physically i think you have to work hard and maybe that was part of the problem most of it i think it is around psychosocial mm -hmm. you know that they're having the right mentality and i've known and you will know you know even from my happy days players mm -hmm. that i talked to pro players who'd say can you remember that player he must be playing yeah. somewhere and no he never made it no. what he was the best player mm -hmm. but you know was a wasn't able to commit to it or you know was was i don't know doing other things or you know so i think it's normally up there somewhat and I think with Adele probably even though as you say like, listen I mean I wouldn't mind having his career you know he's had a sure. good career and he's and I know he's doing really well in, he's done really well in the last couple of years in Portugal maybe you just hope that it clicks mm -hmm. uh, or had clicked a little bit about what he needed to do in the game but nice he was unbelievable and, and when QPR got promoted he you know not quite single-handedly I remember going there and ringing Damien Camoli and saying, mm -hmm. Adele's captain. He's captain for QPR. And they're going, I can't believe it. What's going on? Because, mm. you know, he's not really somebody you'd have as captain material. Yeah. And obviously, you hear all the stories about him. But I, I really liked him. But, yeah, he, 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 you'd like to have thought he could have been on the same level as those other big names mm -hmm. that you thought he was as good as. But he never never quite got there. Mm, incredible. Next one for you, Richard. Uh, most challenging part of your career? Um. I think there's always a point in, in any club where things don't quite go, you know, whether it's the manager changes or the people that brought you in. So, you know, we had lots of turmoil at Tottenham for a time where new managers come in, you think, mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to lose my job. QPR, the two years there was, you know, relegation, promotion, relegation. Mm. Um, I felt on my own, you know, not with that, as I said before, that kind of cover above you where you need some support. A, a guy called Mike Rigg, who's now Burnley's sporting director, was the person who took me into QPR and within you know a few months he'd gone he was on gardening leave wow uh, Mark Hughes was the manager he'd gone so all the people that brought me in and it was just me like last man mm. standing mm -hmm. um and then you feel you know really under pressure because 
you're not sure what people are thinking from above, whether they were forced into these changes and now the people that are gone, whether you're going to be in the firing line, but you, all you can do is your best. And, you know, I'm still good friends with those kind of senior people. And, you know, I got to work with people like Tony Fernandez, the owner who was, mm-hmm. who was good, but yeah, I felt that was really stressful when it all kind of, everybody was not sacked apart from me. Yeah. And like, oh, I just went home. Yeah, I think I think people don't realise the vulnerability in football also. It might be glitz and glamour, but once people start getting sacked, it's a different story. So, yeah, um, yeah it's difficult. Um, next one, um, favourite player that you've worked with? Ooh. It's, a, it's a tough one. I know it's a tough one. Um, yeah, I mean... I mean, I, I like people like, I mean, I could talk about Harry Kane's and Harry Winks's and all those, like, mm-hmm. which, which were great. I, I can remember spending a lot more time going away with somebody like Jaffat, for example, Tanganga, who was, I think is, was, 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 was great. And I can remember him as a trialist going to Arsenal and we didn't normally take trialists to mm-hmm. Arsenal because you always worried that they were going to nick him before yeah. you could. <laughs> So the scout, one of the scouts who helped bring in a guy called Scott Chickleday that you might have come mm-hmm. across. So Scott, I said, right, you look after his mum, don't let her go anywhere. You just keep an eye on her mm-hmm. and we'll play. And Jaffa, just without any kind of malice, just went and smashed everybody and, and you know, left a little trail of bodies. And normally mm-hmm. we used to get bullied at Arsenal. So it was mm-hmm. kind of like, oh, I quite like him. And he was a little bit different, perhaps, or people perceived him being a different type of player than we'd normally signed. But I just, I just really liked him and I took him away on some tournaments. And he's a real character. And, you know, mm-hmm. and I, again, seeing him making his debut, having seen him all the way through from that young age going all the way through. So he was, he, he you know, he, he was very good. Um, he's now almost come towards the back end of his career. But I remember one of my first trips to Italy with Chris Ramsey was people like Jake Livermore and people like mm-hmm. that. So my first session. You know, and again, they don't suffer fools. So you try to do a. Co- I remember doing a coaching session with that group out in Italy, thinking, "Oh my god, I'm under pressure there because there's some good players." <laughs> yeah. Um, and and he, you know, somebody that I came to really like, and Andros Townsend and people like that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I guess I guess those ones. And then you know, even back to the Crown of Manor days, people like Marsh Marshall who's mm-hmm. still playing, and we had Japanese boys come over, mm-hmm. and and there was uh, one boy who went back to play for Tokyo FC, who's the best player that I've ever. If he'd been English and been over here now, he would have been an absolute world beater. He could do yeah. things. And that was against players, you know, when you're playing late in county away, where mm-hmm. you're going to get absolutely smashed to pieces. He was still doing, he was a left winger. Oh my God, he was good. And we played a London Cup final, a midweek cup final. We won 9 0. There was two Japanese boys, one scored six and one scored three. Wow. It was up their game and they were just every sort of goal. Uh, yeah, so yeah, Takashi was name, but he was very good, very, very good indeed. So, um, Incredible. yeah, I've been really lucky, and and you know, I, I was uh, working for England, we did an under 15s program which we introduced, mm. and one of the first groups was the group that ended up winning the under 17. So, I remember being at St George's Park walking behind one of the goals, and you know, when a, somebody shot, shoots and mm-hmm. hits the post, it makes you and it's all smashed. And there was like this little kid over there, you know, sat smiling. And it was Phil Foden. Oh, wow. And I went away with him on a couple of tournaments. And wow, I mean, just, and he was the only one that was, I was talking to somebody the other day. Normally when you get the under 15s, they're a bit shy. Mm -hmm. So you get the London boys all play together. And you've got the, you know, Northwest boys play together. Mm -hmm. The Midlands boys. uh, Phil Foden played with the London boys. Just, okay. you talk about that street thing. There's a good YouTube video that you've probably seen. Yeah, yeah. Phil Foden makes his debut, then goes out and plays on the street. Mm-hmm. And Phil was just like that. And then the other one was Mason Greenwood. We had, um, they used to use Loughborough actually, um, for under 15s camps. And I was there. And I remember he um, took a free kick, pretty central with his left foot, mm-hmm. bent it in the top corner. And then the ball, he got, there was a foul over on our left wing. And he came over and I said to him, now Mason, this is a right footer, I think, from here. He just looked at me and then just bent it in the top corner with his right foot. I'm thinking, his so, finishing yeah, I mean, is unbelievable. His ball striking is a bit. Yeah, you talk about one of the things about Harry Kane. From all his age, he could strike a ball mm-hmm. really cleanly. Mason Greenwood strikes a ball really, really well. Mm-hmm. So, but so Phil Foden does as well. Phil Foden is just. Yeah, I was really lucky to be involved with that under 17s group that went and won the World Cup. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, say Jaden Sancho, which you didn't mm-hmm. play. You know, people like that different class no, incredible you, you mentioned a lot of powerful names there Richard do you feel that's the future of England 
yeah, I, I, you know, I do genuinely believe that we are fortunate now that we are getting this kind of conveyor belt of better players. I mean, the mm-hmm. biggest challenge that we always have is that we tend week in, week out, we're about 32, 33% English qualified mm-hmm. players playing the Premier League and not that many that play uh, abroad. We've got as you've got Jude Bellingham, who I think mm-hmm. is a real talent, and got Jaden and a few others. Um, but most don't. So our pool, is, our talent pool is at the top end is quite small. Mm-hmm. So, you know, pathway and opportunity is the biggest thing, you know, getting minutes on the pitch. You know, Chelsea have done, Chelsea have got the best, I think they've got the best academy. They've yeah. been doing it for years. They've always been hyper competitive in terms of getting players originally from further away, but now mostly mm-hmm. London kids or surrounding areas. But the problem with Chelsea was, you know, a third of our best players in England came from Chelsea's academy, yeah. the younger age groups. Mm-hmm. Hardly any of them actually played in the first team. So mm-hmm. they need, they're not any good for your seniors. Um, you know, the fact that you suddenly got those players that have come through now and getting opportunities to play at Chelsea or the ones who have gone in at Liverpool, like Trent mm-hmm. and those people. And then you've got the ones who are obviously at Man City um, and, and you know some of the Tottenham ones as well, which has been really good. I, I think as long as they can get the game time on the pitch in those you know, because you, you don't want them just being in, and there's no disrespect to being a, a lower team in the Premier League. They're mm-hmm. all fantastic. But if all your players come from those lower six or seven clubs, you want them to come from the top clubs that are playing Champions League football mm-hmm. and, and, and uh, Europa League. Because if you're going to win at international level, they need to be competing on a regular basis where they're getting experience of playing against Barcelona, Real Madrid, PSG, Bayern Munich. Mm-hmm. You know, you need to be getting those kind of games. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I think, you know, the England setup is much better. You know, St. George's Park is fantastic. Yep. Um, the reason why I think we won the 17s and 12 and 20s World Cup is because, like anything, I heard Pep Guardiola say the other day, it's not about this, it's just about having really good players. Mm-hmm. I think I watched it, it was like one of those clips from the old Monday Night Football where it's like, yeah, it's short passing. And yeah. the guy said to him, is that, is, that, you know, is, is that why you're winning? No, mm-hmm. good players. You spend a lot of money. Was that the, the Monday, players. was that with Gary Neville? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, I've saved that, yeah. that one. I know which one you're talking about. I've saved that that clip. It's it incredible. just made me laugh because it was like, you know, you're a tactical genius and Pep yeah. obviously is a fantastic no. coach. And yeah, you know, we just got good players. And if you've got <laughs> if you've got really really good players, that really helps. Exactly. No, for <laughs> and I sure. Think now we have. I think we have got some really mm-hmm. really really talented players. Mm-hmm. No, incredible. Richard, last one for you then. Um, best lesson that you've learned in the last six months. Oh. Um. Best lesson. I did. I did think that you couldn't do stuff like not like this. I had no mm-hmm. interest in. You know, somebody said to me, oh, "Let's have a meeting, and we'll do it on FaceTime." I'd go and yeah. I'd come down yeah. to London. I'm meeting. Yeah. You know, and what I have learned is that you can communicate equal, not as well, but mm-hmm. you can communicate with people in this kind of way of doing things, which then means that you can have a conversation with somebody in America or in Australia mm-hmm. or in you know India. Yeah, I've done loads of stuff all over the world. Mm-hmm. By doing it like this and although it's not as good as being there you know the fact that i do something in japan one day and then something in america the next day and I'm not gonna be able to do that in real life so mm-hmm. i guess i guess there is a little bit about that um i, I think you I, i've worked since i was 18 years old and i haven't really had many days off we have the holidays and stuff like that i don't you know i've worked pretty solidly i've been really lucky you know mm-hmm. i'm not complaining so actually having a little bit more time to to reflect and to do other things and, you know, go out for a run or, you know, do, do things that you probably don't have time to do or mm-hmm. you know, eat better and all those kind of things. So in some ways for me, it's been quite a positive experience and an opportunity to maybe read a little bit more and reflect and, and learn, you know, cause you get caught up in this, you know, rat fast race, spinning, yeah. Yeah, rat race mm-hmm. of, especially within football, you know, mm-hmm. so to, to sit back a little bit and, you know, take stock and, and, and learn new things. And I think has been quite, quite powerful. Mm. And grow a beard also. And grow a beard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. No, it's yeah. looking, it's looking great. It's looking great. Richard, um, really appreciate the time. It was a privilege speaking to you. Um, I initially planned for 45 minutes, but we've gone over that. Um, and again, okay. I really appreciate you just, you know, sharing your journey experience, um, open up a new vision for some of these young players also. Um, and like I said, you've been a pillar 
for you football um, and we can see the the great work that you and the likes of Chris Ramsey, Les Ferdinand and the list goes on. We're seeing the benefits now of the, um, the young English players that are coming through the game and um, really appreciate I want to wish you the best of luck going forward with Loughborough University. Um, hopefully can get myself down there one day um, and, and visit also, visit, visit you in person and do one of these in person also. So I um, appreciate it. Thank you again for your time. No, thank you very much for inviting me and yeah, more, more than welcome to come up and uh, have a look around.